Welcome to the Liberty Entrepreneurs Podcast, where we explore how to build freedom through the entrepreneurial process. Our goal is to provide you with the tools and mindset needed to create your lifestyle of independence and flexibility. I'm your host, Ash Whitener, and this is episode 53, Building a Six-Figure Online Job Board with Mac Pritchard, founder of MaxList.org. After periods of unemployment, Mac finally figured out how to look for work, something that he says isn't taught in high school or college. By learning this skill, he was able to build a business around helping people look for work, as well as helping business owners hire top talent. His site and community, MaxList.org, helps both job seekers and entrepreneurs find the perfect job match. Also, this podcast is sponsored by the Exodus cryptocurrency wallet for Windows, Mac, and Linux. I personally have been using this wallet for a couple months, and I've got to say that it's one of the slickest and most user-friendly wallets I've ever used. Not only does it support multiple cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin, Litecoin, Doge, Dash, and Ethereum, but it also has Shapeshift.io integrated natively, so you can swap in and out of each coin seamlessly within the wallet itself. You can download it on their website, www.exodus.io, and Exodus is spelled E-X-O-D-U-S dot I-O. I should mention that the Exodus team is looking to hire a JavaScript developer who is a cryptocurrency enthusiast. If you consider yourself a freedom lover or libertarian who understands the impact of the current central bank bubble, then apply directly to support at exodus.io. Let's help great minds work together. Keep up with Liberty Entrepreneurs on social media by following on Twitter at Liberty E Podcast and Facebook slash Liberty Entrepreneurs. As always, show notes are found on the website, libertyentrepreneurs.com and enjoy the show. Joining me today is Mac Pritchard. He is the founder of Pritchard Communications, as well as the founder and publisher of MaxList, which is an online community for professionals to find rewarding jobs, as well as employers to find the best possible candidates to help them out. Mac, thank you so much and welcome to Liberty Entrepreneurs. Thank you, Ash. It's a pleasure to be on the show. So Mac and I met at the Podcast Movement 2016 conference in Chicago, Illinois. Uh, We met one evening, I can't remember what evening it was, but we were on our way to a private NPR podcasting party, which I happened not to be on the list, but nonetheless, it didn't stop us, and we had some great conversation about Max Project, specifically Max List, which we're going to get in today, as well as Max Ideas on Entrepreneurship. So, Mac, if you don't mind, give us a brief background of who you are and when entrepreneurship started becoming a part of your life. Sure, I'm happy to do that, Ash. And full disclosure before we start, I too crashed that party. (laughs) And for the benefit of your listeners, it was actually in the studios of WBEZ in in Chicago on on the Navy Pier. And that, of course, is the home of the legendary uh, Ira Glass and This American Life. I think you got a tour of the studio, didn't you? That's right. Uh, I I did not, but someone in your, uh, one of your friends that I met showed me a photograph of what she thought were Ira Glass's eyeglasses. Mm -hmm. So uh, you were close to the source. But let's start with, uh, to to answer your question, Ash, my entrepreneurial journey actually began in childhood. Uh, Having a strong work ethic is a very important value in my family. And my father signed me up for a, a newspaper route at age, when I was age nine. So I I grew up in the Midwest in, in Iowa, and I my first job was uh, delivering the Des Moines Register, and uh, I had a small route, and uh, in addition to adding customers to the route, I was also in charge of all the mechanics of collecting bills and, and paying uh, the newspaper every week, and it was a great education in business ownership, uh, but also uh, just in being able to work with people. Mac, bring us on forward a little bit. You were an entrepreneur as a child. How did that affect you as you started to become on your own? Well, I had jobs throughout grade school and high school and, and college. And when I started my career, um, I was very interested in politics and communications and writing. 
And in my 20s and 30s, I had different positions uh, working as a spokesman for public agencies or nonprofits or uh, working on political campaigns. Uh, and I always thought of my career, while I didn't own a business, Ash, as something that I was in charge of. And I applied, in hindsight, I see now, in entrepreneurial principles to, to managing that career. I always had pretty good goals and a clear vision of where I wanted to go and, and what I wanted to do. I didn't wait to be picked. I, I looked for opportunities. And that helped me find jobs in my career that other people didn't see or didn't know about. And I, I also want to say that it, it wasn't a 45 degree angle. I had some great positions along the way in my career, but I had periods of unemployment too, because I didn't know how to look for work at first. And that, because that's not a skill we're taught how to do in, in high school or college. And I learned how to do it well. And that served me well when I started my company, Max List. What is Max List and where did you get the idea and what pain does it solve? It's an online community and we're, our offices are in Portland, Oregon. We serve people across the United States through our publications and, and podcasts. The heart of it, Ash, is a job board that attracts uh, through newsletters and the website and other channels about 80,000 people a month. And here's the problem it solves. Uh, employers hire people they know or who are recommended to them by people they trust. And what we've done is create an online community that helps people connect with each other in an organic way. We've grown by word of mouth. And if you visit maxlist.org, you'll find a job board there with about 400 listings a month. You also find a blog, a book, uh, a weekly podcast that offer nuts and bolts information about job hunting and career management. And Here's the, the problem that we solve. Employers are looking for people uh, who are passionate about their work, who are qualified, and uh, they don't want to have to screen through hundreds of resumes, which is often what happens when they post on big national boards. Our board is, is focused on, the or on Oregon, and so employers tell us they get fewer applications but they're the right applications. And because they get fewer responses from a posting on Max List, they save ultimately time and money because they're getting the right people without having to wade through uh, hundreds of resumes. The problem we solve for job seekers is they're looking for local employers who are offering rewarding, interesting work. And they also need help with looking for work because that's not something we're taught in high school or college. Mm -hmm. And we, we learn it by trial and error. And so through our blog, our podcast, and our books, and then we have a new course that we're launching uh, this fall, we're giving people the information and the tools and tips they need to, to take charge of their own career. Yeah, and that's a big part of freedom is if you aren't financially free or financially stable, then you're not going to feel free. Yeah. Mech, I believe that Max List actually started as a hobby for you. Is that right? It did. It was a side project, uh, and it was actually a way of uh, being of service to others. And I had worked in the state capitol here 15 years ago. I left that position to take a job in Portland, and I wanted to stay in touch with my former colleagues. Everybody likes to get a job listing, uh, mm -hmm. or who doesn't want to hear about a, an interesting position? So I think. I certainly would get postings across that would cross my desk every month. I imagine your listeners do too. They hear from friends or colleagues. And I created a, a small list with a few dozen names of people I wanted to remain in touch with. And I started forwarding the, the postings to those colleagues. And as the years went by, I started hearing from people I didn't know who said, hey, send this to your list. Or people who said, hey, I hear you have a list. I didn't recognize the value of what I had for a long time, but in the end, after uh, nine years, it became a part-time job. I had created my public relations firm, and I was paying someone on my staff about a day a week to, to run this list, and it was creating, it was a great service to the community, but I hadn't monetized it. And I I thought that nobody would pay for a listing, but we, we threw up a website 
sent a letter to employers, said uh, we need to start charging for this service because we're, we're investing time and money in it. And nobody objected. And the reason when I asked them why is, again, we were saving them time and money. We were providing a valuable service. And the list has grown from there. Originally, it was a few dozen names. Now we, we attract, again, 80,000 people a month. Wow, that, that's incredible. And why, again, would people use MaxList rather than going to, say, Dice.com or Monster.com? Because uh, if they're posting a job, uh, they're serving a hyper-local, they're reaching a hyper-local audience. And we know from annual surveys of our readers that they, the typical MaxList uh, subscriber is well-educated, 90% have college degrees, a third have graduate degrees. Uh, they work in white-collar professions, uh, nonprofits, marketing, technology, um, communications, and most of them are employed. And that, for many employers, is a highly desirable candidate. Uh, they tend to look for people who already have jobs. So it's a well-educated, motivated group of people that has great appeal to, to employers here. Yeah, it's wonderful. You know, at the podcast movement, which again, we both attended, they continue to say the riches are in the niches. Whenever you go to monster.com, it is more of a one size fits all. Everyone can post. Everyone's welcome. Not that everyone's not welcome on max list, but there's a specific type of person that uses max list and a specific type of employer that uses that. And so it's just an online service to help people specifically meet other people who they're going to work best with. I have experience with dice.com. That's one for engineers and technical type people. Yours is for people in the Oregon area, possibly even more so the Portland area, but also uh, people in the wanting to work for nonprofits or wanting to work for a, a PR company or et cetera. I, I think that you've niched down really well and the success is showing. Yeah, I, I think you're making an important point here uh, because there are an estimated 40,000 job boards in the United States. Wow. In Oregon, where we operate, there are, according to the State Employment Department, as many as 80,000 online job postings in this state in one month. We're the 25th largest state in terms of population in the U.S. We're right in the middle. Uh, we get 400 job postings a month in a state that has 80,000 online uh, job listings. So we, it's a, uh, it's a mid six figure business that supports a staff of four and it's hyper local. It's niched down, but for entrepreneurs who are listening, uh, the lesson I think that I've drawn from this is by, uh, there's lots and lots of opportunity out there. You sure you have the big competitors like Monster in, in MySpace or, or Craigslist, but if you're you're focused and you're clear about who you want to serve and you're solving a problem for the people you want to serve and you you you, you can thrive you you can succeed. Mac, let's go back into the more of the beginnings of Max List. I remember you were telling me about a pain or a problem that you had to overcome, which was you built your own platform rather than buying an out-of-the-box solution. Tell, tell me a bit about that. We launched our first website six years ago when we created uh, the job board. Before then, we'd been sending uh, job announcements out by hand via a newsletter, and it was labor-intensive, and we needed to automate the process. We did build a website by an original site uh, six years ago. And if I had to do it over again, I, I would look for a off the shelf product because once you go down that road, uh, you're, 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 you have to keep going back to the same developers and you're just not benefiting from products that are crowdsourced that serve large numbers of people. Yeah. And they have the community behind them. You know, whenever you're f creating your own piece of software, there's no community behind this. But if you go to like a WordPress or some, I don't know what types of job posting board softwares are out there, but there may even be people that just are passionate about this, that build free plugins or something like that. You know, it's, it's very similar to the type of community oriented service that you're providing for max list. It's like, Hey, why, why, why reinvent the wheel? Right? Exactly. Yeah. Open source uh, software offers all kinds of advantages. So I, encourage people to look at it. 
So Mac, let's let's keep this community conversation going. I know Max List isn't just a board where people post. You have a blog, you have a podcast. You know, what are you doing to try to build this community and and how are you seeing it be fruitful or beneficial to what Max List is trying to provide in the in the sense of you mentioned earlier it's more of a grassroots type of relationship or reputation system. People want to hire people that get referred by others. How how are you building this community on Max List? Well, we serve two groups of people, Ash. They're the employers who purchase listings on the job board, but there's they're the job seekers and the people who are interested in those listings. Uh, and we serve both groups uh, by asking them what are their problems, what are their needs. And what we hear from job seekers is that they – don't often don't know what to do after they've looked at job boards and applied for positions. Uh, and, and there's there are estimates out there that as many as eight out of ten jobs are never advertised. They never go appear on Monster.com or Craigslist or Maxlist or any public site. Instead, uh, they're filled by word of mouth. And there's there's no conspiracy here. It's human nature that's at work. People hire people they know or who are recommended to them by people they trust. So your challenge as a job seeker is uh, how do you get into those networks? How do you get in front of the people who are, are looking for candidates? Because they're eager to find good people. And this is, uh, for your listeners, I, I think they'll identify with this. You, you don't want to wait to be picked. Uh, you don't want to just send out your applications if you're looking for work. Uh, and wait for a response. You've got to take charge of your job search and your career. Otherwise, you, you, you won't, uh, you'll have much less likelihood of achieving the goals you want to, to accomplish. And so what we do through our book, our, our blog, and, and our podcast is help people learn those job hunting and career management skills by connecting them with um, national experts, who, who know about this, the, these areas, and, and, and sharing what we've learned in our work with thousands of job seekers. Yeah, I think it's great. You know, one thing I learned from the podcast movement conference is continue to provide value, high quality value, wherever you can. And you can't just, these days, for a, an online company, it's requiring more feedback mechanisms and more ways to communicate with your audience a podcast, a blog, like you said, a book or an ebook, maybe free webinars or free training on something. And it really sounds like Max List is not only a place to come and post a job posting, uh, a wanted ad or I want a job, but also a place where you can get these resources to maybe learn how to interview or I, I you know, I saw your podcast, you've got all sorts of people on there, how to cope with losing your job or what types of questions you should ask whenever you're going for an interview. It's just all, all types of additional quality that you're putting out there that I really appreciate. Thanks, Ash. I mean, and again, what we try to do is address the needs of our audiences. And, and one of the best ways to, to do that is, is to ask them, what, what are your problems? What are your pain points? And they, they, they tell us, and I'm sure you have that experience with your listeners too. Yeah, absolutely. It's like John Lee Dumas said at the conference. It's like, don't guess about what you want to provide to your audience. Like, Go out there and ask them. Because if you go and ask your audience and take surveys after surveys, and this is something I haven't done yet, but if you're out there asking your audience what they want, what their pains are, what they're missing, what's preventing them from getting from where they are now to where they see themselves in the future, then you can you can help produce that. Like John Lee Dumas created the Freedom Journal, which is his 100 day journal of achieving a big task, something that people really struggle with. But he helps people walk them through day by day for 100 days with many tasks and sprints and all of the support, all this types of, of support and structure that somebody he thinks needs to achieve this goal. But he didn't just think up, I'm going to create the Freedom Journal. Right? He went out, he went out there and asked all of the people listening, like, what are your pains? And a lot of people told him, I can't complete or I can't achieve my goals. Boom. Light bulb goes off in John's head and he's able to create something and he's very successful doing it. Yeah. And I would add that, uh, that's not only a great approach to 
creating and running a successful business, it's also the perfect approach to having a rewarding and satisfying career. Uh, because so many applicants, and I, I made this mistake myself earlier in my career when I was working for others, they apply for a job uh, and they, they don't invest the time to find out what the employer's problems are. And right. the candidates who do that and there, you can do, you can do that research through informational interviews or networking and other ways. But the candidates who do that, who find out what is keeping an employer up at night, and then show how they can address that problem and make that employer's life easier, are the ones who stand out in a crowd of applicants. Wouldn't you love to hire someone that comes to you and says? Hey, I was doing some research online and I see your company, you know, doesn't have any type of social media experience or any social media, you know, I, I can help you with that. I see you're hiring from someone that, for a PR position or something like that. And these are the reasons that I think that you need a social media expert on your team or an SEO expert. And these are the ways that I can help solve the pains that you have. It's, it's strange that I think a lot of people see the interview process as a one side question asking process. You know, I'm here, I need or want this job so bad, I'm going to be on my best behavior and I'm going to try to give the best possible answers that I can to, to this, his or her Mr. Mr. and Mrs. Management's questions. Well, <laughs> that's not the case at all. This is, a, this is supposed, to be, supposed to be a mutually beneficial relationship here where both people are better off because they are deciding voluntarily to work together. Why would you get into some a type of relationship like that and not have your own questions? It's do you see this often, Mac, or is this something that you're? I I, I see people make those mistakes, and and I think they do it for two reasons. Ash, one is they 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 mean well, and they they want it. They want to do what it takes to to get the job, and they think by, and it's important to demonstrate your enthusiasm for a position and and your interest in it, and and how. Uh, it excites you, but the other reason um, it they stop there is again they're not they haven't learned how to look for work and they don't see the process from the employer's perspective. Mm. And it's a skill, job hunting and career management that can be learned, like a, a language or a, an instrument or or writing. You just it just takes time and deliberate practice, and and. Uh, and that's a big part of what we do at MaxList now because we want to help people have a, 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 a job they, they can love. And uh, not everybody is cut out to run their own business, but the same entrepreneurial principles that make for a successful business can be applied to your career and your, and your job search, and they can produce the same benefits. Yeah, and while we're on this topic of interviewing and being an entrepreneur, Mac, in your own personal life, how have you found the personality trait of curiosity being a part of helping you become a successful entrepreneur and building a business? I think curiosity is an, an important value. Uh, whether you're building a business or a career, you got to be engaged in what you're doing and excited and interested in it. And if you're not, I think that's a pretty strong signal that you need to, to look elsewhere. Uh, but the people who get who love to learn are the ones who thrive, uh, whether they're starting their own business or in the workplace, if they're working for someone else. Yeah. It seems like that's, you know, curiosity for me is one of the most basic foundations of obtaining knowledge. And I, I used to love interviewing and it just wasn't a one way question. I would be in there. I, I maybe I asked as many questions as the person interviewing me for the job was, but I, I like coming back to curiosity. It's one of my favorite personality traits. And it, it's one that, like you said, takes practice. It's, it's like learning a language. I tend to think curiosity is a language that we tend to forget as we grow older for various reasons. And for me being an entrepreneur, Curiosity is one of the ways that I'm able to quickly learn skills, quickly find and ask people what their passions or talents are. You know, we weren't we we only spoke for maybe 15 minutes or 20 minutes or so, Mac, and I pulled a lot of knowledge out of you, and I learned a lot from you just in that 20 minutes that we were hanging out together at the NPR uh, podcast party. And you know, I, I could remember all this stuff. It's just great. It's a great networking tool. Curiosity is. 
So, Mac, I know a lot of my listeners have online hobbies and, and stuff that they're playing with and, you know, they're passionate about it, but they haven't started generating revenue yet. What would your advice be to someone who's ready, or who thinks they're ready to make that step to cash flowing? Once you have a viable community of, of followers, whether it's newsletter subscribers, website visitors, don't be afraid to monetize or offer to sell something, some product or service that your your followers tell they tell you they want. If I could go back in a time machine and talk to myself uh, ten years ago, it would be monetize sooner. I waited too long, and I uh, and and I that's a mistake. I, I hope your listeners won't make. Yeah, and. and did- why did it take you so long to monetize? Did you feel like you were selling out or did you feel like you didn't have enough product to sell or what was it? You didn't want to stop giving away a free service. I, I started uh, max list as a service to the community. And I thought that if I charge for it, it would be a barrier. And I candidly, I, I also wondered if anybody would, would pay for the listings. And what I didn't realize then, and I see now, is I was providing a valuable service and I was making people's lives easier. I, uh, employers told me later I was saving them time and money. And so even by it, charging them money. Yeah, it, I was making their life easier. I was providing something they needed. And so uh, my challenge to your listeners would be if if you're doing that, if you've created a community and perhaps it's come out of a, a side project like Max List did, um, think about the, the value of what you're offering. And it's okay for it just to be a hobby, but uh, you, if, if you want it to be more than that and you want to turn it into a business, if you are providing value and you are making people's life easier, you're solving some problem, people will pay you for that because uh, they're – they're getting something in return. Yeah, absolutely, Mac. That's great advice because I think profit tends to have a negative connotation for some reason right now in our American culture. But profit, ultimately, what that means is that you're you're giving people what they want. You're satisfying someone's need. You're giving them value, and they want to give you value back in return. It just happens to be their value that they give you is most of the time money. But if your if your hobby is making money, well, it has it, it has a lot more longevity at that point. Now with MaxList, you're not dumping thousands of dollars a month into this just as a whole to do something good for the community. You're able to do something good for the community while making a profit, you know, a voluntary profit that people voluntarily pay you for. And then you're able to use that profit to hire people, to expand the business, to do, you know, the, the hack, the hidden job market class, to write books. It opens up time. It gives you a lot more options to continue to look for more ways to satisfy the needs of your community. Agreed. The revenue helps us serve more people and uh, supports our mission, which is to help people get the rewarding work they want that makes a difference. Uh, and we're sir, in, when we first started charging for job listings six years ago, we had 4,000 people on our mailing list. Uh, today we have 28,000. Wow. So like we're doing something right. The, absolutely. And just the mere fact that you guys were able to scale like that while continuing and starting to charge for your services, you know, speaks volume about the quality that you're putting out. It's, I think that that's something that people underestimate a lot is the value of what they're putting out there for people to use. In your case, it's max list and they feel hesitant to charge for it. But the proof's in the pudding here, Mac. It's empirical that you know you're charging for a service, and more people than ever are using your service and and paying for it. And it's created jobs. It's created more opportunity. I think it's it's really great. It's not only creating jobs for you to hire people to run Max List, but it's helping employers and employees create jobs and match up with each other. It's it's just a very efficient machine when you run things like a business. Mac, I really appreciate you coming on the show today. Is there anything that you would like to mention, any resources you'd like to give away or how people can get in touch with you? Well, I encourage people to come to our website. It's maxlist.org. And it's not just for people in Oregon. They are, our job 
board is largely made up of physicians from uh, the Pacific Northwest. But there's a weekly podcast called Find Your Dream Job. We publish every Wednesday, and it attracts a national audience because we provide ideas about job hunting and uh, actionable tips on career management that you can use anywhere, whether you're in the United States or listening around the world. Uh, we also have a blog, uh, again, with great ideas and tips for job hunting and career management. And on November 1st, we'll launch a online course called Hack the Hidden Job Market. And it provides tools people can use to uncover and get uh, those eight out of 10 jobs that never end up on a job board, whether it's monster.com or Maxlist or, or Craigslist. Well, I think that sounds great, Mac. And I mean, what a good guy to help somebody find a job. I can't, I can't imagine, you know, what, what that has to feel like to constantly help people find employment and the, to be able to take care of themselves and take care of their family. That's terrific, Mac. I'll definitely include all of this in the show notes. November the 1st, coming out with an online course called Hack the Hidden Job Market. For any of you looking for a job, this could be an opportunity for you. Anybody that is looking to become a digital entrepreneur, you know, some of Mac's advice I hope was helpful. And maybe you know a very niche market where you have people always asking you, hey, do you know somebody hiring for this? Or do you know where I can get a job in this? Maybe an online job board is a way for you to become a digital entrepreneur and a liberty entrepreneur. Mac, it's been a real pleasure. I, I appreciate it. Do you have Twitter or an email address or anything? My Twitter account is at Mac underscore Pritchard. And my email address is mac at maxlist.org. Awesome, Mac. I will include all of that as well. Thank you so much for coming on Liberty Entrepreneurs. Uh, thank you for having me on the show, Ash. It's an honor. You just listened to episode 53, Building a Six-Figure Online Job Board with Mac Pritchard, founder of maxlist.org. Don't forget to check out the Exodus cryptocurrency wallet at www.exodus.io. That's E-X-O-D-U-S dot I know you're going to find it both beautifully designed and easy to use. If you or someone you know is a JavaScript developer with a libertarian perspective on the world, you might be a good fit to join their team. So submit your CV or cover letter or other work experience to support at exodus.io and good luck. Until next time, keep building freedom.